welcome to Hollywood. The Armed Forces Radio and Television Service brings you the Hollywood Radio Theater, starring Cornell Wilde and Terry Moore in The Walls of Jericho. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Irving Cummings. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. There is a well-known saying, there's no fury like that of a woman scorned. And we shall prove it in tonight's play, The Walls of Jericho. This best-selling novel by Paul I. Wellman was made into an absorbing, absorbing motion picture by 20th Century Fox. And as our stars, Cornell Wilde, who is recreating his original role, and lovely Terry Moore. Now, Act One of The Walls of Jericho, starring Cornell Wilde as Dave and Terry Moore as Julia. The year is 1908. In Washington, Theodore Roosevelt is serving out his last year in the White House. In New York, Wall Street mutters of another financial panic. In Chicago, a woman is arrested and tried on a charge of driving an automobile without the presence of a male escort. And in Jericho, Kansas, there's talk of paving Main Street. Young Dave Connors, the county attorney, is the moving force behind that project. Right now, Dave and his wife, Belle, are at the supper table. Yes? What do you want? Good evening, Mrs. Connors. Could I speak to your husband, please? He's busy. He's eating supper. Oh, but it's terribly important, Mrs. Connors. You mean it's your father again? Yes, ma'am, but but I promise this will be the last time. Mm -hmm. That's what you said before. Oh, Bill, what is it? Nothing, Dave, just Julia Norman. Mrs. Connors, please. All right. All right, I'll tell him. What do you want? The usual thing. It's that drunkard father of hers. Oh, now, Bill. Well, he is. He's a disgrace to the town. And also the most brilliant attorney Jericho ever had. <laughs> Save the pie for me. I'll eat it when I get back. Dave, you haven't got time. Why not? Well, you said you was going to the depot to meet Tucker Wedge and that woman he married. Oh, I'll have time. The 620 has never made it in before 8 o'clock yet. Now, Belle, in case you've changed your mind... I, I haven't. Did... You know how I feel about your fine and fancy friends. All right. Well, hello, Julia. Oh, thank you, Mr. Connors. I guess you know what's the matter. Uh-huh. Where is he? At Gotch McCurdy's. All right, let's go. I kept asking Mr. McCurdy to let me go in and get my father because we have to leave on the 620. Leave? Where are you going? To Chicago first if my father is well enough. Well, uh, we'll see. You wait outside here. All right. McCurdy? Hey, gosh. What do you want? Jeff Norman. This is a livery stable, Connor. It's not a saloon. Now, let's see that you keep it that way. Next time we find liquor around here, you'll get more than a fine. Now, where's Mr. Norman? You got a search warrant? Nope. And you ain't gonna go snooping around, even if you are a county attorney. Uh, Mr. Norman! Jeff Norman! Get out of here. Now, is that crowbar intended for me? Well, make up your mind. What's it to be, Gotch? I... I was just testing you, Mr. Connors. You can go in and get him. Thank you. Mr. Norman? Well, well. Were you calling me, huh, Dave? Mr. Norman, Julia's waiting for you. She's a good girl, Dave. Wonderful girl. She sure is, sure. Now, you've got to catch a train. You know why, Dave? Mr. Norman, would you... My cousin died, Dave. Way off eastern Delaware. Left her whole estate to Julia and me. That's why I'm celebrating, you see. Julia and me. We're going back to collect the money. Got to celebrate. Come on now, Mr. Norman. You can hold on to my arm. Come no, on. no, no. Not ready yet. Yes, you are. Now, on your feet. Where'd you get that bottle? Now, Mr. Norman, where'd you get that liquor? Same place your wife gets hers. <laughs> Sorry, Dave. Shouldn't have said that. Didn't mean it. I know. Oh, all right. Take me to Julia. Oh! Goodbye, Mr. Connor. 
Waters. And thank you again for everything. Oh, not at all, Julia. Goodbye, Mr. Norman. Goodbye, Dave. See you soon. Oh. Dave! Hey, Dave! Hey, Tucker, you old son of a gun! <laughs> How are you? <laughs> Welcome home. I told our Jerry you'd be here to meet us. Oh, it's good to see you. I'm sure I'd know you anywhere. Oh, now, really, ma'am, why? Perhaps because Tucker's talked of no one else. Wait until you meet Dave, how he can tell a joke. Uh, and as smart as he is, goodness Oh, knows. please now, honey, I didn't go on quite that strong. <laughs> well, almost. <laughs> well, Dave, suppose you say something. What do you think of my bride, huh? Well, I, I'm sure she's going to be quite a revelation to Jericho. Thank you. <clears throat> Tucker, these your suitcases? Yep, sure are. Hope you brought along your rig, Dave. Hate to pack these all the way to the hotel. Hotel? Yes. Tucker says he doesn't want to take me to his old home. He wants to wait until he can build me something suitable. Oh, I see. Well, my, my rig's over there. Good, good. Hey, by the way, how's the Daily Clarion been doing without me, huh? Oh, well, the boys have been playing it safe with the editor out of town. They have come out pretty strong against sin and cruelty to animals. <laughs> <laughs> ah, here we are. I I'll take care of your bags, Stoker. Okay? Ah, thanks, Dick. Hey, yeah, get into it. Mr. Connor? I was hoping to have the pleasure of meeting your wife. Oh, well, she she was looking forward to it, too, ma'am, but she's got a sick headache. And... Oh, I'm sorry, but I hope soon... Uh, 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 Dave will arrange it when he can, my dear. Well, how about Saturday night at our house? Why, we'd love it. Well, then I'll tell Belle. Saturday night it is. Get up, boy. And this is Tom Ransom... He runs the best dry goods store west of Topeka. How do you do, Mr. Randall? Yeah, happy to know you, Mrs. Wedge. And this is my daughter, Marcy. How do you do, Mrs. Wedge? My dear. And these gentlemen are Judge Hutto, Mr. Pettigrew, Dr. Patterson, and a certain newspaper editor known as Tucker Wedge. Uh, that honor, Mrs. Wedge. My pleasure, ma'am. Gentlemen. And now that Dave's done the honors, my dear, may I present your hostess. At last, Mrs. Connor. I've so wanted to meet you. You have? I mean, I hope you like living in Jericho. How can I help it? After meeting such charming people. Really? Mrs. Connors, I've been admiring your beautiful piano. I hope you'll play for us. Oh, Belle doesn't play, Mrs. Wade. No, oh, Dave does that. I'll put on the gramophone for you. Well, I just love the gramophone. I play it for hours and hours. Don't matter what piece. I got it all cranked up and waiting right now. No, that's all right. But Belle. I want to play it, Dave. Later, Belle, please. This is one thing Tucker didn't tell me about Jericho. Oh, what's that? The summer night. The air, so soft and friendly. Uh-huh. Well, if you'll excuse me, I'll I'll go indoors and see if Bella... Dave. Yes? Tucker tells me you're thinking of running for Congress. Oh, well, I've kind of had it in the back of my head, but that's still a long way off yet. It needn't be. I'm sure you'd have the support of the Daily Clan. Well, I hope so. The paper could be a great help in the things I want to do. Mm-hmm. You must drop by sometime and tell me about it. Well, thanks, I will. When? Well, I I, I don't know exactly. Tomorrow? Yeah, I, no, I'm afraid I have to go to Topeka tomorrow. Then as soon as you get back. Well, all right. S suppose all of us have lunch at Ajax's house, then. Hmm? Oh. Well, you and Tucker and oh. I... I see. Perhaps we had better go back indoors, Mr. Connolly. Your nights are colder than I thought. Hey, Dave. Hey, Dave. Good morning, Tom. Hey, will you slow down a minute? No, oh, I'm due at the courthouse, Tom. Uh, have you seen today's play? Not yet. Why? Uh, you take a look at this editorial on the front page. Uh, hmm. Blame for vice and bootlegging situation in Jericho, late county attorney's door. Yeah. The clarion today begins an expose of certain unsavory situations which David Carnes has chosen to ignore. Well. What do you make of it, Dave? I thought Tucker Wedge was your best friend. He is. Well, then. Uh, I don't know. Perhaps somebody just thinks I need a warning. Of... Well, you don't scare easy. Nope. Now, that may be too bad for all of us. Bell. Bell. So 
Davy. Bell. No, Davy, don't turn it off. Well, Bell, I, I saw Tucker Wedge today. He says his wife mailed us an invitation to the housewarming at their new home. Came last week. Well, why didn't you tell me? I thought maybe we weren't being included or... You'd go to their house after what Tucker's written about you? Oh, darling, that's just newspaper. Well, I'm oh, not I going. I haven't got a new dress. I'll buy you one. Gotta come from Chicago. Bill, the party's tomorrow night. You don't care how I look in front of your fine friends, do you? Everybody will be running after the beautiful and talented Algeria way. Oh, darling, this is all in your mind. I'm not no... going. All right, Bill. <laughs> Yes, dear. There's a party about this time. Oh, I told you, Tucker and Algeria's third wedding anniversary. They missed you. Perhaps next time you... Yeah. Next time. <laughs> Belle, you finished dressing? Uh, Belle, we're due at the party right now. Then what are we waiting for? Tucker and Alger, my dears, I'm so honored to be one of your guests and to meet the great Senator Grimes. Belle. Oh, <laughs> Belle. <laughs> Go on, Davy. Mm. Go on by yourself. It'll always be this way. I'm sorry to hear that, Dave. I hope Belle feels better real soon. Oh, she will, Tucker. You We're know. glad you came anyway, Dave. We'll introduce you to Senator Grimes as soon as I can tear him away from that pack of women. Meanwhile, you know where the refreshments are. Yes, the we'll center of that pack of men. <laughs> Evening, Dave. Well, how are you, Tom? Yeah, I'm glad you're here, Dave. Tonight can be the turning point in your career. Oh, you mean Senator Grimes? Yeah, he controls the mm. state machine. If he takes a liking to you, you're as good as on your way to Congress. Well, I, I still haven't made up my mind. Yeah, you better before the evening's over. Dave. Oh, good evening, Judge Hutto. Been looking for you, son. I just hired me a new assistant to work in my office, and she wants to meet you. You say she? Why, certainly. Been looking for you, son. Yes, sir. A real life, honest to goodness, she lawyer. Oh, come on, Dave. Well, I'll be. <laughs> Here he is, my dear. I'll be back with the sandwiches. So good to see you again, Mr. Connor. Why, Julia. <laughs> Julia Norman. <laughs> ah, I'm surprised well. you recognize me. The last time you saw me, I was just a freckled faced kid getting on a train with her father. Oh, but it's only a few short years, and now the way you look like, it's almost a miracle. The miracle to me is that Judge Hutto has taken me into his office to read law for him. He's a smart man. He's using his head, or at least his eyes. Hey, Dave, Dave, I, I just found out why Senator Grimes is here. You have, Tom? Yeah. Tucker is going to announce that he's running for Congress with the senator's support. Oh, so that's it. I told you you should have made up your mind sooner. Now it's too late. Well, what's done is done, Tom. Well, don't let it ruin the party for you. It already has. Got to find me something stronger in this iced tea. Mr. Connor. Dave. Hmm? Uh, yes, Julia. You're terribly disappointed, aren't you? Well, in a way. Oh, Julia, let's get out of here. Let's find some place where you can tell me everything has happened to you. Hmm? Is your rig outside? Yeah. Then I know a place. Whenever I was troubled, I always used to go there and just sit. Yeah, the lake. The lake. Mm -hmm. Rowers Point. I'm sorry to hear about your father, Julia. He was a fine man. Well, at least it wasn't a long illness. He lived long enough to see me enroll in law school. Oh, was it his idea? Mostly, yes. You see, before I was born, Dad was sure I'd be a boy. Then he just kept on pretending that I was. He started teaching me law when I was ten. Maybe that's why I had so little trouble with the bar examinations. After that, I wrote Judge Hutto. He gave me a job, and well, here I am. And I'm glad. <laughs> Good. Oh, well, let's stop over there, Dave, by that tree at the edge of the water. All right. Oh, boy. Dave. Yes? They're still thinking about Tucker Wedge, aren't you? Well, I don't understand it. He's never shown any interest in politics before. Now, what decided him to run? His wife. Algeria? Why? At the party, I saw her watching you clear across the room. 
She likes you too much, Dave. Oh, now, just a minute. She likes you and she can't have you. So she's going to make what she does have climb the ladder until he's more important than you are. Hey, that must have been some law school you went to. Some things you don't have to be taught, Dave, if you're a woman. Well, I guess not. You know, if Algeria is pushing Tucker into this thing, I'd like to teach him both a lesson. By running for Congress as an independent? Yep. Then do it. Can you imagine the faces if I went back to the party and told everybody? I'm in the race against Tucker. Yes, why not? <laughs> Dave, is there something wrong? No, I suddenly just thought, well, this is the sort of thing I ought to be talking over with my wife. Belle should be the one to encourage me. Instead, it's you. You're frightened, aren't you? Well, I don't know. I... You mustn't be afraid of my loving you. Julia. Yes, I've been in love with you ever since I was a kid. That's part of why I wanted to come back to Jerry Cove. But you mustn't be afraid of my love. I want only for it to make you strong. Well, thank you, Julia. Where are we going? Back to the party. As of tonight, I'm in politics, Julia, and to win. We'll continue with Act Two of The Walls of Jericho in just a moment. Our servicemen in Europe have a wonderful opportunity to observe new customs and traditions, and they're finding out that these ideas of other people aren't so strange after all. For instance, in almost every country, France, Spain, Scotland, the Scandinavian countries, Germany, Greece, Austria, there are special celebrations on the 24th of June every year. This is known as Midsummer's Day, and it's marked by music, dancing, and bright costumes. At night, huge bonfires are built. And the merriment continues. This same day is also celebrated in North Africa and in Japan. Well, in our country, we pay no special attention to the 24th of June, but we have more so-called holidays than any other country in the world. Hardly a day in the year goes by without some special attention to it. In addition to the national holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, Fourth of July, Labor Day, and so on, every state has its own founding day. We have a day for fathers, mothers, and even mothers-in-law. We have a Be Kind to Animals Week and Eat More Frank Fritters Day. We plant trees on Arbor Day, send love notes on Valentine's Day, close the bars on Election Day, and keep them open an hour longer when daylight saving ends. We honor the birthdays of Washington and Lincoln. We mourn the passing of our friends with the Memorial Day. Yes, like all countries, we set aside special days for special consideration. True enough, the way in which we celebrate them may be different, but the ideals are the same. These things that have become customary and traditional are important to the people who follow them. And our servicemen are helping to maintain goodwill by observing the customs of other people in other lands. Now, our producer, Mr. Cummings. Act two of The Walls of Jericho, starring Cornell Wilde as Dave and Terry Moore as Julia. It's the following morning. In the office of the county attorney... Dave Connors confers with his new campaign manager, Tom Ransom. <laughs> I tell you, Dave, I, I won't forget last night if I left Bill Hudred. <laughs> Man, did that <laughs> announce with yours break up that party yeah. fast? <laughs> yeah, but, but now in the cold light of day, Tom, what do you think my chances are of getting elected? You're darn good. You've got a lot of friends around this county. More than Tucker? Sure you have. Hey, but you got to take the offense. You whip out some sort of a statement for the general public. Yeah, I'm working on it right now. Good. Uh, when it's done, I'll run it over to the clarion. <laughs> Tucker will have to print it just to show what a good sport he is. <laughs> come on in, Miss White. Your Miss White seems to have gone to London. Oh, uh, Julia, come in, come in. Hey, Tom, would you mind just for... I'll just be a minute, Mr. Ransom. Oh, sure, sure. I'll be right outside. Oh, darling, I've been counting the hours till I could see you. Please don't, Dave, don't. Oh, but, Julia... I'm... I came here, Dave, to tell you I made a mistake last night. I shouldn't have said the things I did. What? You you mean about loving me? Yes. Try to understand, Dave. I've loved you since I was a child. When you used to come and see my father and didn't even know I existed. And later, when when you had to go down to Gotch McCurdy's livery stable and bring Dad home, I wanted so to tell you how I felt. Julia... He was seeing you again last night after all those years. I couldn't hold it in any longer. It's wrong. All wrong. Because I'm a married man. Yes. But, Julia, I, I, I need you. You're I don't know... saying that out of a sense of gallantry. A woman says she loves you, so you must say as much. Oh, no, it's not that at all. If, if you knew what my life with Bella's been... I don't want to hear about... Dave, we mustn't see each other again. 
Julia. We mustn't. You... Already Tom Ransom knows I'm here in your office. I'm rooming with Tom and his wife. If they see you calling I on me... I don't care. I'm going to see you tonight. Goodbye, Dave. Julia, li listen to me. Goodbye. Tom? Tom? Yeah, Dave. How about that statement for the clarion? I'm getting out a new one right now. Well, let's see how you're starting it off. Uh, to the voters of Jericho County, 23rd Congressional District. Dave, are you out of your mind? You can't. You just can't. <laughs> Algeria? Algeria? Yes, dear. Guess what, dear? Dave Connors isn't going to run. Uh, are you sure? Certainly. He just issued a statement. It's here in the paper. But why? What issue did he get? Well, none, except that after careful consideration, he finds it impossible to devote the necessary time and energy to the office. <sighs> oh, too bad. This is the last thing I expected. What? What? Uh, Algeria, I, I, I thought you'd be delighted. No. I wanted to beat him at the polls, beat him before the public. You wanted to. Oh, you know what I mean, darling. You know, there are times I'm not sure that I do. Well, personally, I, I think Dave took this way to show his friendship for me. It was a sporting thing to do. Oh, don't be naive, Tucker. Dave quit for a reason. If I only knew what it was. Well, it hardly matters. But it does. You don't suppose that he... Tell you what? Nothing. But I wonder. I just wonder. Oh, good evening, Mr. Connors. Well, hello, Margie. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Connors, but Father's working at the store tonight, and Mother's at choir practice. Yeah, well, uh, is Julia in? Mm-hmm, in her room. Julia! Julia! Won't you come in, Mr. Connors? Well, thank you. Dave. How are you, Julia? Margie, don't you have some homework? Mm, oh, yes. <laughs> Excuse me. Well, I, I suppose you know why I've withdrawn from the election. Yes, in case people found out about it. But they're not going to because I'm leaving Jericho. Julia, what... All I can do is hurt you, Dave. What happened today proves it. So this afternoon, I asked Judge Hutto if he could help me get a job in Kansas City. Happens that there's an opening with a firm of Grosset and Strauss. And nothing I can say will stop you, even if I ask Belle to free me. You're not going to ask her. She needs you, Dave. Uh, yes. When do you leave? Tonight on the 11.40. I see. I'll, I'll take you to the station. Thank you. Julia, Mr. Connor. Yes, Margie? I have something to tell you. I'm... I mean, well, somebody's been going by outside, been watching. Watching what, Margie? This house. Could you see who it was? Well, yes. Mrs. Wedge. Algeria. Oh, well, I didn't know what to do. I mean... That's all right, Margie, and thank you. Uh-huh. Well, let me know if I can help you pack, Julia. I will, dear. See what I mean, Dave? You mustn't go to the station with me. Julia, come here. Goodbye, darling. Goodbye. Dave? Dave? Yes, Bill. Want to see what I tore out of the clarion? Another story for your scrapbook, I suppose. It's getting to be a big, fat book, isn't it? Representative and Mrs. Tucker Wedge arrive in nation's capital. Wedge on Ways and Means Committee. Congressman Wedge and wife accompany President Taft on Western tour. <laughs> All these headlines. You could have read just as easily, Congressman and Mrs. Dave Connors. Yes, just as easily. But you didn't seem interested at the time. That's right. It's all my fault. Oh, Belle, what is it? You refuse to have friends, you won't go to parties, and yet you're angry because we're not in the headlines. Oh, what's wrong, honey? You didn't act this way before we were married. <laughs> Belle? Bill, how, how would you like to go up to Chicago for a few days and buy you some new dresses? No. Huh? Oh, Bill, leave that gramophone alone. Bill. Bill. 
Dave, I hear you were in Kansas City yesterday. Yeah, that's right, Judge. I need some more evidence in that Randolph case. I hope you stopped by to see Julia. No, I didn't. Oh, that's too bad. I think she would have liked to see you. She wrote me a while back saying that uh, she hoped you'd try for that Washington job again next election. I intend to, sir. Good. This time you won't have Tucker for competition. Here he's putting himself up for senator. Oh, well, then it looks like he's still my competition. Dave! <laughs> well, bully for you, boy. Bully for you. Dave! Dave Connors. Well, hello, Algeria. I thought that was you coming out of City Hall. Uh, how are you, Algeria? We weren't expecting you and Tucker back in town till next week. Well, Tucker decided to get an earlier start on his campaign. Now that you're running against <laughs> I see, I see. You look wonderful, Dave. Well, and you too, Algeria. I'm not too sure how Jericho's going to take to that skirt you're wearing. Well, it's time that Main Street saw a woman's ankle. You see plenty of them in Washington and New York. Well, perhaps, but this is Jericho. Well, you should be encouraging me, Dave. After all, I'm giving the home folks something to gossip about besides Tom and Myra Ransom. Tom and Myra? Dave, surely you've checked up on the background of your own campaign manager. Algeria, what about Tom and Myra? I think you'd better ask Tom. Well, I will, but I want to know what other people are saying. Well, when the Washington papers carried the story of your running for the Senate, they carried Tom Ransom's name, too. Well? Some people we know in the Capitol used to be friends of the Ransoms when they lived back in Virginia. It seems that Tom and Myra aren't married. They never have been. I don't believe it. Well, that's the story, anyway. Uh, I'll have to hear it from Tom's own lips. And even if it's true, it won't make any difference to me. It won't. No. And one thing more, Algeria. There's no such gossip going around town. Just see to it that you don't start it. Or, or have you already? <laughs> I see. You're really out to win, aren't you? Yes, Dave. And I will. Hello. Hello, Central. Keep trying that number. I know they're home. They've got to answer. How do you know they will? Went by Tom's house. He wouldn't come to the door. He and Myra can't lock themselves away from the whole town. I would. A story like that got around about you and me. <sighs> Bill, will you please get that front door? All right, all right. Hello, Central. Central, this is Dave Connors. Will you please try 016 again? Thank you. Dave? Dave, come here. Yes, what is it? This note was stuck in the door. Let's see it. Dear Mr. Connors, I thought you could help me, but I guess nobody can. Please tell my father and mother not to look for me. Goodbye, Margie Ransom. I know, Dave, I know. Myra and I ought to have realized all this talk had hurt Margie more than us. Maybe we should have told her the truth long ago so she'd have been ready for it. Oh, there's no use blaming yourselves now, Tom. Right now, we've got to try to find the girl. The sheriff is looking, you said. Yeah, but they're doing it by guesswork. If you could remember if Margie ever said she wanted to go someplace in particular when she grew up. I tried to remember. I just can't think, Dave. I can't think anymore. Want me to get it? Yeah, and we're not at home to anybody. Hello? Dave Connor speaking. Dave, Dr. Patterson. Can I talk to Tom? Well, not right now, doctor. I'll take the message. Maybe it'd be better if you just came over here at the hospital. You mean, is it Margie? No, but she's mixed up in this. I just brought Gotch McCurdy in. If he doesn't pull through, Tom's girl is going to be wanted for murder. One of the brakemen found him down in the freight yard. He was dying when they brought him in here. Gotch kept saying Margie did it to me, the ransom girl. Hit me with a shovel. And that's all, Dr. Patterson? You couldn't get any details out of him? No, he went into a coma right after that. He'll be gone in a couple of hours. Oh, then his words are, in effect, a deathbed statement. Yes, but what in the world would Margie doing down there in the freight yard? 
Running away, probably. Do you have any idea where she is now? Well, it depends on how much of a head start she has. Any way of telling when Gotch was injured? Yes. When he fell across the railroad tracks, he broke the watch in his vest pocket. It stopped at 11.38. 11.38. Wait a minute. That's just before the 11.40 to Kansas City. Do you have any money to buy a ticket? Well, not according to Tom, but she might have tried to sneak into one of the baggage cars. Yeah. But there were a couple of other trains going north. She might have taken any one of them. Unless you think she has some special reason to go to Kansas City. A special reason, Mark? No, no, I guess not, Doctor. As you say, she probably headed north. Apartment 7A, 7B, C, D. Ah, this is Who is it? Dave. Julia. Come in quickly. I'm so glad you could come. You didn't tell anybody about my telegram. What telegram? I sent it to your house. It was about Margie. Oh, no, I didn't need a telegram. I thought she'd come to you. She's always looked up to you. To both of us. Margie, you can come out. It's all right. Hello, Margie. Oh, Mr. Connors. Mr. Connors. Oh, it's going to be all right, Miss Margie. All right. I didn't mean to kill him. He saw me crossing the freight yard, and, and he kept coming at me. He was so drunk. Oh, Margie, so... He is dead, isn't he? Yeah. I hit him so hard. Harder than I meant to. I know, Margie, and <laughs> you've got nothing to be afraid of, but first you've got to come back to Jericho and tell people how it happened. Oh, no, no, not to that awful place ever. I hate it. The way people laughed at me. Now, listen to me, Margie. No, this... I'll die first. I'll just die. Now, Margie, you trust me, don't you? And, Julia, you know we wouldn't ask you to do anything that wasn't right. He's right, Julia. You must go back now of your own free will before anyone comes and gets you. Will you go back with me, Julia? Do you want me to, dear? All right. I'll go. Now, there's a train leaving in an hour. We've just got time. Come on. Margie, if you'll go in the bedroom closet and get down my suitcase. In the closet. All right. It's been a, it's been a long, long time, Julia. Too long. I know. Dave... Margie's going to be all right, isn't she? I mean, when the jury hears her story. I hope so. We, we can't take any chances. I'm going to need your help. At the trial? Oh, no, Dave. Oh, you've got to. Margie trusts you. But there's another reason, isn't there? Yes. This may be the last time we can ever be together. Always the last time, Dave. We said that before. I, I can't help loving you, Julia. You know that. Dave, we mustn't. Julia. Oh, my darling... My darling. In a moment, Act Three of The Walls of Jericho. Make a friend and you make an ally. There's a thought for you to keep in mind, as many another American has. Although Emery Alvord graduated college with an A.B. in agriculture, he wasn't completely happy. Through the work of a local missionary group, he discovered there was a great need for agricultural assistance in southern Rhodesia. So together with his wife, Albert volunteered for the job. At first, they found the backward Bantus disinterested, the climate almost unbearable, and living conditions far from ideal. But Albert wasn't discouraged. He planted a corn crop that yielded more than the natives had ever seen. Then the Alberts built a new house for the boss of the village, not a crude hut like all the others, but constructed of bricks which they made themselves from straw and mud. When it was finished, the boss moved in with some misgivings, spurred on by the local witch doctor. Gradually, however, as the Alberts' work brought bigger and better crops to the natives and improved their living conditions, the fears and superstitions of the natives were dispelled. And eventually, even the witch doctor was won over to Christian thinking. For 30 years, the Alberts remained to gain the love and admiration of the natives throughout most of southern Rhodesia. As one grateful Bantu chieftain expressed it, Cecil Rhodes founded Rhodesia, but Emery Alvord founded the people of Rhodesia. Emery Alvord did something else, too. He discovered that by helping others, you help your country. We pause now for station identification.
curtain rises on Act Three of The Walls of Jericho, starring Cornell Wilde as Dave and Terry Moore as Julius. It's the second day of the trial of Margie Ransom for the murder of Gotch McCurdy. In the hot and crowded courtroom, judge, jury, and spectators watch the prosecuting attorney and Dave Connors, chief defense counsel, battle for the advantage. At the defense table, Julia Norman busily takes notes on the arguments. And then in the last row of the spectators, a man and a woman get up and slip out of the courtroom. Objection sustained. The prosecution may proceed. Now, oh, Dave's sure not letting the thing get past him, is he? Do you think he'll get her off, Tucker? Oh, very likely. Everybody knows that girl couldn't commit murder. Why not? What? How curious. Oh, really, Tucker? Don't you see what this trial can mean to Dave? All this free advertising just before the election? Well, Dave's just lucky to have a good case, that's all. You don't have to help his luck by printing everything he says in your own newspaper. My dear, I happen to be a newspaper man. And a candidate for the United States Senate. Or are you going to let Dave take the job by default? Please, Algeria, I can hardly arrange for Margie Ransom to be convicted just to win an election. No, I suppose not. But there ought to be something you can do to offset Dave. Well, we'll see. Meanwhile, don't forget we're having lunch together. Algeria, lunch. Oh. Not today, Tucker. I, uh... I have some things to do around town. Your Honor, the state at this time wishes to continue the cross-examination of Marjorie Ranson. Marjorie Ranson, take the stand. Now, Miss Ranson... You told us that on the night in question, Mr. McCurdy followed you to the freight yard. He seized you, and in self-defense, you swung the shovel at him. Yes, sir. Now, will you tell us what you were doing in the freight yard at that time of night? Running away. Ah, yes. Yes. Running away. From what? Well, I... I... Well, go on. Tell us. I was just running away. Just running away. And uh, you intended to let no one stop you. That's why you hit Mr. McCurdy, wasn't it? Your Honor, objection. All right. All right. I, I withdraw the question. Now, Miss Ransom, would you tell the jury why, if you were simply defending your honor, you didn't stay and report it to the proper authorities? I, I didn't realize I'd hit him so hard. Oh, come now, Miss Ransom. Did you or did you not run away because you knew you had killed Mr. McCurdy? That you were guilty of murder. Yes? Oh. <laughs> That's all, Your Honor. You may step down now, Miss Ransom. Your Honor, the defense calls Miss Julia Norman to the stand. Julia Norman. Hey, Dave. D Dave, I've got, I've got to see you. No, not now, Tom. But I have to show you something. Later, Tom. I do. Take the stand. Well, will you give your name, please? Julia Norman. You live in Kansas City? Yes. Your occupation? Attorney at law. You formerly lived in Jericho? Yes. How long have you known the defendant? Most of her life. And did she ever come to see you in Kansas City? Yes. She came to my apartment the morning following Mr. McCurdy's death. I see. And what did she tell you about her running away? Did she consider herself a fugitive? She did. What? <laughs> a fugitive, yes. From slander and cruelty and prejudice. Occasioned by what, may I ask? By circumstances over which she had not the slightest control. Her birth. The attorney for the state will refrain from questioning the witness until cross-examination. Now, Miss Norman, tell the jury what else you and the defendant may have discussed in your apartment at Kansas City. We talked about a return to Jericho. After she had learned that Mr. McCurdy had died and that murder charges had been filed against her? Yes. She decided of her own accord to come back here to answer the charges and prove her innocence. Thank you. Your witness, Mr. Pettigrew. <clears throat> Hello, Miss Norman. Do I understand you to say that the people... Dave, you've got to read Jericho this newspaper. Later, Tom. Dave, it's the clarion. This is what is on the street right now. <laughs> All right, let me see it. Dave Connor's suit for divorce. Wife name's Julia Norman corresponding. Very generous of you, I'm sure. Miss Norman, tell me. What is your relationship to the chief counsel for the defense, Mr. Connors? Associate counsel. 
Is that all? Don't answer that, Julia. Your Honor, I ask for a recess. For what purpose, Mr. O'Connor? It's partly a personal matter, Your Honor. It requires my immediate attention. Well, unless the matter has some bearing on the case before it us. It could well have, sir. Unless I settle it now, it may become highly prejudicial to the defendant. Very well, Mr. Connors. This court stands adjourned until 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Belle? Belle? I doubt that she wants to talk to you. Algeria. So, you're behind it. Right out in the open, huh? Right out in the open. And don't think you can persuade Belle to change her mind. Where is she? Belle? Belle? Belle. Get out of here. Now, listen, Belle, I'm not going to let you drag this thing through the mud. <laughs> you dragging who through the mud? You can have the property, everything. But if you try to make a scandal, I'll fight you to the end. There's more at stake here than an innocent woman's reputation or your petty revenge on me. Now, you've listened to Algeria Wedge and, and you're why not... why not, Mr. Connor? I've spent a good deal of time watching you. I know about your trip to Kansas City. Oh, and that proves everything, doesn't it? Come on, Belle. Let's just sit down and talk this over. Get out of here. Belle, will you leave? I hate you. Never good enough for you. No. You married me when you had nothing. When you started up, you were ashamed of now, me. Now, you know that isn't so. Keep away from me. Look, you're all upset, Belle. I, I told you to get out of here. Belle. Put that gun away. Mrs. Connors, don't be a fool. Come on, Belle, here. Give me that gun. No, no! Oh. Oh. <laughs> Dr. Patterson. Yes? You can see him for just a moment. How is he? Still suffering from shock. Lost a lot of blood. We're going to give him another transfusion. So remember, only a moment. Yes. Julia, I wanted to see you in the trial. I'm going to ask the judge to put it over, Dave, until you're well again. No. No, Tom Ransom was just here. Yes? He said, Marty, find the pictures. His wife, too. you got to wind it up now. But, Dave... Finish it for me, Julia. You can. You must. Miss Norman. Right now, Doctor. Julia, see Bell. Why? Make her tell you about Algeria. Algeria? Miss Norman, I must ask you to leave. All right. Julia, see her. All right, Dave. I promise. Then it is the understanding of this court, Miss Norman, that you do not wish a postponement. That is right, Your Honor. Very well. You may call your next witness. Before doing so, Your Honor... May I point out that this case is no longer an ordinary murder trial. It has become a political contest which may well deprive the defendant of her right to a fair trial. Your Honor, I protest. The word has gone out. Beat Dave Connors in court and you won't have to beat him at the polls. Your Honor, Your Honor, this is outrageous. I insist that the jury be dismissed while these fantastic charges are being aired. The court will decide if the charges are fantastic, Mr. Pettigrew. May it please the court. I make the following offer of proof. One... It is a divorce action filed by Mrs. David Connors against the chief counsel for the defense in this case was instigated by the wife of Tucker Wedge. Two, I shall prove that the charges in the divorce complaint linking my name with Mr. Connors came from the fertile imagination of Algeria Wedge. And third... Your Honor... I anticipate your objection, Mr. Pettigrew. The court feels that Miss Norman's offer of proof is immaterial to this case. The jury is instructed to disregard Miss Norman's remarks. Judge Hutto, if I may... Miss Norman, I suggest that you proceed with your defense, if any. Then, Your Honor, may I take the stand to answer the last question which was put to me yesterday by the prosecuting attorney, just before we took the recess. Very well. Mr. Reporter, read the concluding question of yesterday's session. Question. Miss Norman, what is your relationship to the chief counsel for the defense, Mr. Connors? Answer, associate counsel. Question, is that all? My answer to that question, Your Honor, and gentlemen of the jury is that it is true that I am and have been in love with David Connors. But that there is anything scandalous in our relationship, that we have ever at any time done anything to spoil it, that we are guilty of the conduct described on the front pages of the papers. 
I deny just as forcibly as I confess my love. My first reaction to Mr. Pettigrew's question yesterday was anger and bewilderment. I was ashamed. I wanted to run away. Just as Marjorie Ransom ran away when she was faced with the slander and gossip of this town. Your Honor, this is no longer testimony, it's argument. Yes, Mr. Pettigrew, my concluding argument. I ask that the court remind the jury that Marjorie Ransom was a competent and voluntary witness in her own behalf. That the state's own witnesses have testified as to the unsavory character of the late Mr. McCurdy. And that the jury consider the facts which caused Marjorie to run away from Jericho in the first place and that they return a verdict of not guilty by reason of self-defense. That is the plea that I know Mr. Connors would make if he were able to be here today. Defense rests. Julia. Dr. Patterson said that this time I can see you for as long as I want. You sure can. I'm feeling better by the minute, especially since hearing the jury's verdict. I brought you a copy of the Clarion in case you wanted to read about it. I will later. Julia, you know where the credit for today belongs. You are wonderful. Well, I'm glad you think so. But maybe you'd better read the Clarion right now. At least tuck a wedge of statement. Tucker's? Mm-hmm. Right here on the front page. All right. That's it. Open letter to the citizens of Kansas. This afternoon in Jericho County Courthouse, more than an accused girl was vindicated. All doubts are now wiped away, and David Connors stands clearly before us as the logical choice as senator of the state of Kansas. <laughs> Therefore, I ask my supporters to cast their votes for my lifelong friend. My lifelong friend. And that part, I'm sure, is to put Algeria in her place once and for all. I hope so. Dave, what about Bell? I'm not going to prefer charges. I told the police I wouldn't sign a complaint. I'm glad. Well, I'll be going, Dave. What for? There happens to be a train to Kansas City in just 35 minutes. Uh, Julia. Yes? Belle is still going through with her divorce. She is? Yes, and if you're going back to Kansas City simply to help me, it won't make any difference. Well, do you... Do you want me to stay? I want you to want to stay. Oh, I do... Oh, I do so much, Dave. I'm so tired of running away. Well, you'll never have to again. You've come home, Julia. Home to stay. In a moment, our stars will return. This is really a story about two people. One is Chief Petty Officer Harry Frame, a veteran Navy electrician who saw lots of action in the war in the Pacific. The other is Mrs. Sadaya Ishiwata of Tokyo. Mrs. Ishiwata turned her home and her fortune over to 53 boys and girls of all ages who were orphaned by World War II. And Chief Frame devoted his off-duty hours to helping this tiny Japanese lady. He organized his friends into work teams, and because of their work, the home took on a bright new look. New panes of glass were installed, a new girl's dormitory was built, and twice a week, a Navy truck rolled up with leftover food, writing paper, worn-out clothing, and other contributions from the men. Chief Frame made it his private project toward better relationships between people of two different countries, and it's paid off in mutual goodwill. Such acts by you and your friends today are shaping our world of tomorrow. Now, here's Mr. Cummings with our stars. And here they are coming forward for a curtain call. Cornell Wilde and Terry Moore. <laughs> Cornell, did you know that the Photoplay Magazine Awards this year voted Terry one of our most promising young actresses? Yes, indeed, and I think they used excellent judgment. Well, you're very nice to mention it. Not at all, Terry. We've seen you grow up from a child actress to one of the most popular young actresses on the screen. And I hope you'll both be listening next week when we bring you another of our 20 great, the Daryl F. Zanuck production, which won the Academy Award as Best Picture of 1947, Gentleman's Agreement. And as our stars, Ray Milan, and in her original role, Dorothy McGuire. Well, that was a very fine picture, Irving. Good night. Good night. Good night, and hurry back. <laughs>
Radio Theater is produced by Irving Cummings. Our orchestra is directed by Rudy Schrager. This is your announcer, Ken Carpenter, inviting you to be with us again next week at this same time for another presentation of the Hollywood Radio Theater. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.